I want to uh, make a brief video, five, ten minutes long, however long it takes, uh, in response to a lady's question. I had a good conversation with a lady from South Carolina yesterday, and uh, she asked a thought-provoking question I had never really been asked before, never really considered before. Um, she had been told and taught that uh, after the rapture, Gentiles no longer have any chance to be saved. That they must get saved now in the church age. If they don't, all chances will be uh, taken from them after the rapture of the church. So she had called to ask uh, if I could shed some light on that. And uh, so I, we talked for five minutes, and then I, we said, well, maybe I should record a video addressing that subject. So, uh, Sister Rhonda, this is for you. I'm, I'm trusting you're going to be watching either this weekend or by next weekend, catch our video. I want you to start, however, um, in the book of Numbers, chapter 35. I'll have you turn to two or three places with me as we address this question. Um, can Gentiles be saved after the rapture? Uh, and if so, how do they get saved? But first, I want you to start, if you will, at Numbers 35. Numbers 35, let's read one verse there, verse 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. This is what we would call the doctrine of two or three witnesses. And it's given throughout the scriptures, uh, eight different times, at least eight different times that I could find. And uh, let me run through a list of those scripture references. Uh, this one here, Numbers 35, verse 30. And then Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Matthew 18, and verse 16. John 8, verse 17, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Hebrews 10, verse 28, and the eighth time is in 1 Timothy 5, 19. And uh, if you didn't get it written down quickly enough to see me afterwards, I'll give you that list again. Those of you watching on the internet, you can just back it up and start the video again. But it occurred to me about a year and a half ago, as I was reading through my Bible, I came across this text. That's the ironclad rule given in the Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, for establishing the truth of the soundness of any idea, of any proposition. And um, it's kind of like the Catholic Church's uh, claim that Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus was making Simon Peter the first pope. The Catholic Church... The, the Catholic papacy is not based upon Matthew 16, verse 18. It's only based upon the Catholic Church's interpretation of Matthew 16, 18. But the verse doesn't exactly say so, if that's what Jesus intended. But even if there was one verse that said that, they still need at least one more, even two more. The more, the better. So if God repeats eight times that... You need at least two or three, better yet three, witnesses to confirm something, to establish the truth of some proposition, then uh, you have a right to ask somebody, if they say something, give me two or three verses to prove that point. Many times someone will say the Bible says this or the Bible teaches that, and they haven't got one verse to prove it. They heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody, and it's just been repeated. And I don't mean... You know, disrespect to people who have come to believe certain things that way, but I do wonder how serious uh, that person might be about the Word of God. You have to have at least two, better yet three verses confirming the same idea to, so you can then say it's a Bible doctrine. Now, having said that, let's get to the question, can a Gentile be saved after the rapture, and if so, how does a Gentile get saved after the rapture? Now, Brother Gene has made uh, 
a sort of an unpaid uh, career with videos like this one, but that's okay. Um, it's not a competition. Right now, Jews and Gentiles must get saved the same way, by trusting in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, for, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 8, down to about verse 18, um, makes it clear that God is intending to join Jews and Gentiles together by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says there in Ephesians 2, 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And the Bible says, 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12, this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The Apostle Paul identifies three different groups in the world right now. He says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. There are three distinct groups uh, in the world right now from the Scriptures. There are unsaved Jews, there are unsaved Gentiles, and then there's a third group made up of both saved Jews and Gentiles, which make up the Church, the Church of God. Those three groups are, exist in the world. Um, to suddenly deny salvation to the Gentiles after the rapture would be as arbitrary, as uh, capricious as denying it to the Jews. Why one group and not the other? Uh, the Bible says about God, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. When the rapture occurs, however, all believers, both Jews and Gentiles, will be caught up to be with Christ, and they make up the body of Jesus Christ. They make up the church. Uh, Jews and Gentiles combine together. When that happens, and the tribulation begins, salvation will no longer be by grace through faith plus nothing, as it is now. It's commonly taught that way. It's commonly taught by radio preachers and guys on the air who want to take your field your Bible questions on the air and answer your question on the spot. Uh, they say everyone's saved in every age the same way. They were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. We're saved in the church age now by looking backward at the cross. And it'll be the same way after the rapture. Those will be saved by, look, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ by grace through faith. No, they won't. If salvation after the rapture is the same as it is now, then how do you justify the rapture? Why do we get raptured, but they don't? It would simply be a continuation of the church age. Something drastic has to change when the saints are caught up, Revelation 4, 1, when we hear the words, come up hither, and uh, the plan of salvation will be different than it is right now. But once that happens, salvation will not be uh, by grace through faith alone. It will then be a combination of faith coupled with works. And I, I told this uh, dear lady on the phone, uh, how much works, how much faith will be required, I don't know. But it doesn't really matter to me because I don't plan to be here. Yeah. In uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, the Jews returned answer to Moses and they said, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. But in the New Testament church, we're told, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus 3, 5. It's the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost who washes and regenerates and renews the sinner when he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. There will be some combination of Old Testament revelation coupled with New Testament revelation uh, then required of every sinner following the rapture of the church. In Revelation 12, verse 17, the Bible describes the rules for the Jews 
during the tribulation. It says, and the dragon, that would be Satan or the Antichrist, the dragon was wroth with the woman, Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, those would be Jews left behind after the rapture, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there's something Old Testament, something New Testament joined together. You're not saved by worrying about keeping any commandments right now. You're saved by trusting what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. It's a great spiritual transaction that takes place by faith. But that's not what that verse described. And then God gives almost the same wording for all people, Jews and Gentiles, Revelation 14, verses 11 and 12. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You have Old Testament rules and New Testament rules coupled together. Uh, the Bible asks a very interesting question, the book of Psalms. We're, we're in our Sunday school hour. We've been studying the book of Psalms for at least three years now. We're almost to the end. Uh, we're in Psalm 147 today. We're almost to the end of the book of Psalms. And throughout that book, and I've said to, the, said to you many times now, that has to be ranked as one of the most prophetic books in the entire Bible. Because it points to the second coming of Christ, it points to the rapture of the saints, it points to the tribulation, the Jews' persecution under the man of sin, it points to the glorious return of Christ, it points to his second advent in his kingdom here on the earth as the Messiah of Israel, finally. All of those things have been anticipated and pointed at and predicted over and over again through the book of Psalms. <clears throat> but... Uh, God asked a very interesting question, and he answered his own question in uh, Psalm 24, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? That's a very good question. Who will be worthy to approach Jesus Christ seated on his throne of glory in his kingdom? And then he answers his own question. He that hath clean hands, they're clean because of good works, and they're clean because they have no marks in them, and a pure heart. And uh, Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. If you want to run over there, let's run over there. Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Almost the same wording. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Answer, he that walketh uprightly, notice, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. There's works coupled with faith in the heart, joined together. Look at Psalm 21. Psalm 21. Psalm 21, and verses 7 and 8. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. That's why he says in Psalm 24, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Those will, be, those will identify the ones who hated God during the tribulation would rather worship Satan in human form and those who would resist the man of sin and uh, receive no mark. I would imagine much of the work in the tribulation for both Jews and Gentiles will be to simply resist the man of sin and avoid taking his mark. But more specifically, for the Gentile, it will come by helping the Jew during his greatest time of persecution. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, 
Alas, for that day is great, so that there is none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, that he shall be saved out of, it, out of it. So the tribulation we look at as the time of Jacob's trouble, where the greatest persecution will be focused on the Jewish race, as the eternal people of God and the eternal obstacle in the path of the man of sin and Satan. But let's go to Matthew 25, and the words of the Lord Jesus should be most compelling, most convincing of anything as we make our case. Matthew 25, and let's begin at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Well, that's not the rapture. That's not the secret catching way of the saints. That's the visible return of Christ after, the rapture, after this tribulation. And before him shall be gathered all nations, he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you took me, gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, he have done it unto me. And then jump down there, uh, verse 46. Those who did not do those good works, verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous, and the righteous are identified as those who did those good things up there in verse 40. But the righteous into life eternal. So, the plan of salvation for both Jew and Gentile will be to resist the mark of the beast, resist the man of sin, uh, endure to the end. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved, Jesus said. And uh, for the Gentile, they help the Jew in his time of persecution. It's funny, everybody in the world today thinks that they, they're capable of earning their own salvation. I don't need God. I don't need to go to church. I certainly don't need the Bible. I don't need your old-time religion. I don't need uh, Jesus or any of that stuff. I'm a good enough person. I can earn my way to heaven. Well, when they're put on the spot, let's see if you can earn your way. That'll be the true test. But the test are for the salvation after the rapture for both Jew and Gentile will be to resist the mark of the beast, resist the man of sin, and worshiping the image of the beast, and for the Gentile, add to that, helping the Jew in his worst time of affliction, his worst time of persecution. That's how someone will be um, valued. That would be the criteria by which Jesus rewards the sheep uh, in his kingdom. That's how someone is saved after the rapture in the tribulation. They say, well, my preacher always said that uh, salvation after the rapture will still be by grace through faith. Well, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but your preacher's wrong. <laughs> just read the scriptures. And I think I can say with some confidence, I've just now given you more than two or three scripture verses to support that point, to make that point, to establish that as a doctrine of the Bible. Whether everyone else knows it, whether everyone else has ever been taught it or believes it, is irrelevant. It means nothing to me. What is important is, what does the Bible seem to indicate? And that's what the scriptures seem to indicate. That salvation will be by uh, works and faith coupled together. And like we say, uh, I don't know how much work or how much faith because I don't plan to be here. 